Hey guys, Corey here uh, with a new video on the part five of our uh, Python cloud server tutorial. Um, <clears throat> sorry if my voice got a haircut, by the way. Uh, sorry if my voice is a little off or if I seem a little tired. Uh, I'm actually just getting over being sick. Uh, there was a bug going around. Um, I feel good enough to do one though. So uh, here I am. I just wanted to finish this up because uh, this is probably going to be the last one. <clears throat> uh, been a week since I posted one of this, so I may miss a couple things, but I'll try to cover it all um, on, on what we've done since the last video. This will probably be the last one because we went over air handling, and um, actually, I think I'll make one more. On there's plenty of videos out there on how to open up your ports and everything, so I'll probably not do something on that, but we'll see if I'll uh, <coughs> have anything else I need to talk about. Um, so let's get to it. Uh, I put in air handling, a lot of air handling. Usually I'll code it out before the video, just to make sure it's all working, and then recode it you know, with you guys. Um, this time though, I ran into air after air for a long time, and now that I fixed it, um, some of the solutions were quite uh, intense, um, and it's really, it's stable now. Like, I, can't, I can't break the server. Like before, even if, if they got out of sync, if there was an error on one end, it didn't matter what the end was, if a file didn't exist, all those, like, if the slightest thing went wrong, it would crash. I can't, I can't, I can't break, the, I've been trying to break the server, there's probably ways to break it, but I can't, I haven't, the normal stuff won't break it. It can handle if files don't exist, if it sends bad data, if the other guy hits an error, if they get out of sync, if the other guy just randomly disconnects, it's good. So, uh, it's all working, it's really stable right now, but taking out anything, We'll have some really tricky errors that took me a long time to figure out how to fix. And when we covered that part, we'll get there. So I'm not going to cut it out for you guys now, but we'll walk through every line of the code to see where we're at now. Because I also reorganized some things in my quest to figure out what was wrong. I also changed um, the, the background and the font. Um, I kind of want something dark to look at when I'm staring at it for a while. Um, I also like this font because I, <laughs> I'm a big Mega Man fan. I'm a big classic kind of 90s video game fan. Uh, and this, you know, kind of... Um, Really, the exclamation points kind of a <laughs> remind me of those fonts. I really, I really like those the the, the font. Um, so, if this makes it harder for you guys to see, just let me know. So, uh, let's get into it. Let's actually start the server. All right. So, let's go over what the server does. Remember, our job for our server is to sit there on whatever line that we that we talk about, and we just use one twenty seven point zero point zero point one, which is our personal computer's IP address, or you know, it just reroutes to it's the special IP address that reroutes to us. What you can do is you can go command and go IP config, and you can use um, uh, there's this one, and then you can also look up your local machine's IP address. Um, when you open up ports, the videos, if you look up how to open ports, those you know, 100% show you. Um, that you, you, know, you do this, you find your IPv4 address, um, and you tell it to sit on there. This is your router. Your computer, everything on your home network goes through your router. So, um, so what you need to do is you need to go into your router, like where's the uh, default gateway? This is your, your router right here, okay? Um, 192 always means local, right? So you would type, you can go on this video, so they'll show you how to get onto your router. I'm not gonna show you guys now. Um, and uh, you'll have it reroute incoming traffic to your IP address, which is uh, this one, I believe. And then you can have it sitting on that IP address, okay? And I tested that, and it worked and everything, but we're not going to do it here because uh, I closed. I don't want open ports, so I closed the port. Uh, so let's go through it. So its job is to sit here, wait for clients, and then pass them on. That's its only job. Um, it has some other functions you'll see I put in here. And you'll see some print statements. I'm getting rid of those. Uh, they were just in there for testing. Um, because if you import those into the other code, it's going to hurt you a little bit. Because uh, you don't want prints when you don't need them. Otherwise, it could junk up things, uh, display when you don't want it to and such. So I'm actually going to take that out. Um, I'm going to keep this in just so you guys see when it connects. Yeah, I'll keep it all in for a little bit. A little bit longer. Um, and this I'll just make return in the end, but we'll get there. So you can also, though, when I import it, you can also access a list of current clients. You can delete and close clients and uh, stuff like that. And we still, I still have the old parser in here. So you can see it's still not that long, so let's walk through it. So uh, class server inherits from threading. That way when I import it and it's doing its own things, it's not going to interrupt our main line because the server can go off and do its own a thread can go off and do its own things without holding us up because the server's in basically a, a while true loop and that's going to hold up our program indefinitely. 
if we have other things going on. Like say we have a behind the scenes database reorganizing things. Um, <clears throat> or you can have multiple threads. Like say you want to come and you know type some commands in person through a terminal to the server. You know, you know, it's only talking to clients. So that's that's bad too. That's something I, I actually do with this. So when it initializes, it just takes an IP, a port, and the number of backlogs. Uh, backlog is once again is that line of people that once a number of clients are waiting in line beyond that number, it'll start automatically rejecting people that come in past that point. Once we accept a couple people, then we'll accept a couple people, you know, to wait in line. Uh, but if anyone comes after that hundred spot in line, you know, they're gone. Uh, but we can set that to whatever we want. Just store it in some variables for us. I accept. Uh, or I kick up the socket. Uh, socket dot socket. Just start it up, and then I just bind it to whatever we're listening to. Okay, um, put the defaults in so you don't always have to put in something. Like when I'm testing, I don't I always like to put in something. I just like to run my code. You know, I don't want to waste time putting in things like that. Um, so we just start listening. We, we set the listen variable, which just means how many people am I going to listen for or let wait in line. I don't know why they chose listen, but it's how many people you can, you're going to let wait in line. All right, we just, that's where we pass that. Then I just make some empty things for file locks and current cons. File lock is... If multiple clients are accessing the same file, data could get corrupted, especially if one guy's updating it and one guy's downloading it. So I have a list here of active file locks, and when one of the clients goes to access it, it'll also be stored with a threading lock in there. Um, uh, and when he tries to access it, which you see right here, actually. Um, actually, that's for someone else. We'll get there. Um, that's for when we try to delete clients. So there are a couple of variables when they try to, you know, like when a connection handler is closing, he's going to come in here and take himself off the current connection list. But if we don't want multiple guys handling that, especially because they're searching through it, they're iterating through it. If somebody changes the length of it when he's iterating through it, we're going to get all kinds of problems. So we're going to use locks. Locks are basically like, uh, you know, uh, a bathroom, for instance. You go in there, you turn, you lock the door, and nobody can come in until you're done, right? That's what this is. That you come in, you access the variable, and you lock it, so nobody else can come in and uh, you know uh, deal with it behind you until you release it. It's it's amazingly useful. I even sometimes make a uh, print message function that just uh, you pass in a string and it prints it. But in the meantime, before and after, it locks, uh, it gets a lock, prints it, and then releases it. So that way, if I have multiple threads all printing out things, they'll use instead of the print command, I have my own custom print message command. So that, because uh, if they print at the same time, it all gets mixed. So that's a way to keep things clear. You know, locks are really useful for handling threads. Otherwise, they can be nasty. Uh, we just call the constructor for a, uh, we just call super, con the super initializing method, which basically just means uh, the thread has a lot of stuff in its initializing function that it does to make sure it can run as a thread. And so we have to also, I also call that. I just go, hey, pass in yourself and call in the initialize function for your parent, which is thread, so that we can still get all that important stuff set up. So run. It's just going to go in a while true loop. It's just going to sit here until it accepts somebody. It's going to tell us it made that connection, and then it's going to make a client handler object, and it's going to start that, and then it's going to append the current connection. It's going to append the client with the object that's handling them and the IP address. Okay? And then it's going to display that. Um, that's just for testing purposes for me. Um, closing server and connections. <clears throat> so if we ever break out of the while loop for some reason, uh, it'll just delete all our clients. If we still have clients, it'll be like, hey, I'm shutting down, bros, and it'll close itself. Um, which I should probably put in front. No, actually, that's fine. That's fine. Because <clears throat> if the server actually closes, it's just since its job is to only accept new people, it's okay if it closes before we close all of our current clients. We can actually shut down the server and still be talking to the people. You know, like closing time when they lock the doors to a restaurant, but whoever's still in there can still eat. It's kind of like that, because our client handlers are dealing with them, not our servers. So if our server shuts down, our, our handlers are okay. They can still keep dealing with it. No new people can come in. So it's okay if we have it that way. Display clients. Just for everyone uh, inside of connections, we just display, uh, it just says the number of the clients starting at one for ease of user readability. I like starting at zero, but just I have teammates uh, that are non-programmers that work on my servers for, you know, statistics or whatever, and uh, they like starting counting at one, <laughs> so I put that in there. So it'll just display one and the IP of the connections and stuff. Uh, <clears throat> they never really need to see that, but just in case. 
delete, delete client. So it just goes in, and gets this lock here for the same reasons as earlier that I stated. Um, I like my haircut. Um, I like you know when you when you get the little short hair and you rub your hand. <laughs> I back to work. Um, uh, so it acquires the lock, so nobody else can come in here and mess with things. Goes in the current connections of whatever index you put in. So because you know it'll display index four is IP. So if you put in four, it's really the third index in the list. So he'll just subtract it out. And then the zero grabs the object because you remember we appended the object and then the IP. So we grab the object and we tell it to quit. And that's a function inside of client that just turns on a flag that when he sees that he goes, oh, they want me to stop. And I'll tell the client, hey, we're done here, bro. And then you know, shut it down. Okay. Uh, and then he'll just pop them off. And then he'll just release um, the lock so other people can come in. If he never releases that bad, nobody else can come in. It's like if you like, I don't know if this happened in high school where guys would lock the stalls and then like crawl out. So you would think someone's in there and like wait for five minutes. I never got why that was funny, but they, they did it. <laughs> um, so that's kind of what happens if you don't release it. Okay. And then we delete all clients. Basically just for every client in there, it just deletes them. It just calls uh, delete client. It's pretty simple stuff. Uh, this part stuff is, I believe, the same. Uh, we just have our argument parser. We just take in the host, the port, and the backlogs. Uh, if there are none, we just set them to the default values and pump them in. Because if we were just to put in arcs host, arcs port, arcs backlog, it'd go none, 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 and nothing would happen. And then we start our server. So not terrible. Um, don't need to save that because it didn't really change anything important. Um, <clears throat> let's go to the handler. All right. So, uh, client handler, he also inherits from thread. Uh, that way, well, the server makes a new version of him. Uh, the server can continue doing what it's doing instead of waiting for the client handler. Its initialization function is eerily similar. Um, it just takes a connection object, an IP, and a server. Uh, the server, it, it takes in a server object so that it can go in and when it, if it needs to shut down, it can go in and take itself out of the server's list of current connections. So that way the server doesn't think it has a connection open, but really doesn't have a connection open. Okay. Um, you could do it a different way. You could just do it with, you know, you don't necessarily need to do it this way. Uh, this is the way I like to do it. So uh, if, it, if it makes sense to you though, uh, for another way and it works, it works. You know, as long as it doesn't terribly sacrifice optimization or whatnot. So here's that self.quit variable. That's going to be our flag for us. It's going to be set to false because obviously you don't want them to quit right off the bat. And self.results. So basically I did this instead of a print statement. I have a variable called self.results that whenever a command happens or files are transferred, it just stores it in self.results and we return that. So if I'm running them in a code, I need to check if something was successful. I can just check self.results. Like if self.results equals file uploaded, then I know I'm going to continue on. Otherwise, resend the file, you know, stuff like that. Uh, just so other programs can access how he's doing, you know, how they can check out. It's like a, his Facebook feed, you know, they can go on there and check, how, how you doing, man? <laughs> we do the same thing with the other one. We call the super initialization function of the threading class so we can set up all that important stuff to make sure he's going to continue being a thread. And then we have a run function, okay, which happens every time you call start on a thread. Uh, I forgot to mention that. Sorry. So we have a big try step statement. So why did I add a try step statement? Because normally, if it runs into any error, the program just shuts down. No, done. Gonzo. If you have it in a try accept statement, even if you have something like pass here, it won't shut down. It'll just continue to the next line, even if an error is raised. It'll continue to the next, the next loop in the, in the tray. It'll uh, continue to the next loop of the run, the run um, kind of deal. Um, uh, in fact, actually here, if he has an error, he actually takes himself out. I had accept going, but it was being, it was weird. For some reason, it wouldn't trigger correctly. So I just put a finally statement and a pass here and it worked. If it works, it works, man. So um, this should all be like this finally stuff uh, should all be inside of an accept statement. It was just being weird for me. I got it to work this way. So I decided to leave it and you know not poke the beast anymore. Um, uh, in this case, when when you know an error is raised, he'll 
pull himself out and kind of shut down. Uh, because if we're looking here, right, the only air he's going to reach is if, like, he, like, this computer he runs on, he can't access the command line, which is really important. It means the computer's, like, shutting down or doing something weird. Or if he can't, if he tries to send data and the other guy's, like, no bueno, uh, uh, it means he's not connected to the client anymore or something's going wrong, he'll just abort. Um, you could have it not abort. You could have, uh, you know, have it run, do its run function again, you know. Or you can put this inside of another function and whenever there's an error, just restart, just recall it and start waiting again. Um, I chose this way because if there's an error, it's more likely than not that the other guy is disconnected. And so, uh, and, and if it does unfairly disconnect, the client can always reconnect, so it's not a big deal. Uh, if we look to the meat of our, try, our, our run function, which is our main function, we have a message variable. It's just going to store what the user sends us. As long as they haven't sent us right quit, or as long as our quit uh, flag isn't set to true, we're just going to keep, we're going to chill. We're going to keep running. <clears throat> We're going to be doing our work. So just receive data. Um, it's a pretty basic function down here real fast. Uh, basically, real quick, just receives the data and just decodes it for us, just so I don't have to put the decode every time. If I want it, though, I have the receive byte data, which is receive 1024. Uh, I don't really need this function. I don't think I used it really anyway. I could just do self.con.receive1024, um, but sometimes I get bored writing the 1024, so I just put receive byte data. But honestly, it's probably easier just to um, the one line below it. I, I should probably delete that function. I don't even need it. Um, I'm tempted to delete it, but I bet it'll be somewhere. And as soon as I delete it, I'll screw myself over. Right. Um, yeah, so that, that function is not really needed. Self.receive so we get our message. And then we check if message is right quit, we're going to just continue. Uh, that makes it so I don't really need this message up here. You know, while message and I call right quit, I just have it for assurance in case anything slips through. Nothing's really going to slip through, but I just like to have it. Um, maybe the client sends a right quit, you know, or some. Oh no, that is that would trigger. <laughs> what am I saying? But uh, I don't know. Maybe in the future, I have one of these things return a right quit if it's like needs it to abort itself or something. You know, I don't know. Um, so well, that still wouldn't trigger. But I don't really need the message is not equal right quit up here is all I'm trying to say because I have it covered here but I just have it up there uh, just because it's really easy to see when someone's reading if they don't want to see the bulk of all the commands they can really easily see um, oh this guy will break if you trigger his quit flag or if the client tells him to right quit so it's not a big deal you see even message equals right quit just turns quit to true you know so space hmm. so we have not that many commands we have download file and upload file uh, so if this is the client handler, who's so on the server. So if the user says download file, it means this guy has to send the file to them. Okay, so it's kind of you got to think of opposites here. And the file name is just the rest of the message. So the first three letters are df, uh, and then file name is message for continuing on, and then we just send the file with the file name. We'll go over that function in a bit. Uh, message three. Uh, the next one is just upload file. So if they are uploading a file, we're going to be receiving it. Next is change directory. The reason we have that is because it sometimes doesn't work on subprocess.popen and it doesn't really return any results. So if we did it here and then we had this and we tried to send nothing, um, usually, oh yeah, I fixed, I did error handling for that as well. Before you may notice if it sends nothing, the other guy won't receive anything and they'll get out of sync because one guy will send it, think he sent his message and wait for results or whatever, but the other guy never got anything. So he would be waiting for a message too, and they'd both be waiting for a message. I have also uh, put in error handling for that. I just have this print self.results out there uh, as well for uh, testing. All the prints should be gone in the final code. Um, this is the final code, but when you're done testing, they should be out of it because you don't want things printing in your code unless you absolutely want them to. Because if you have other things printing, you import some module and you're working with it, uh, and it starts printing things and it starts interjecting with your data, it can send some serious errors out there. Um, so if it's not in our commands so uh, they send in change directory we just change the directory we have another try accept statement because things can go wrong here otherwise we'll just say error in changing directory directory may not exist we'll store that in results uh, pretty straightforward otherwise we'll just put the new directory we're in now in the results um, otherwise it'll just pipe it to the command line it's like I don't know what it is do you know what this is computer and just pipe it to the command line pretty easy stuff we just open up the, the shell we just open it up here and then we just say 
hey, pipe out what comes from the, st the standard output and the standard error back to us. And just store it in command. It'll come in as, um, like, uh, I don't know the exact data. I think it comes in a binary. I know this decodes it correctly to UTF-8. So I assume it comes in a binary. I've, I've pr not really, pr I think I printed it out and it was bytes. Yeah, 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 it was. So I just decode it and then I read it, read it, put it in results. So that way, if we want to read it, we can. Um, so we can, we also get a free SSH, you know, in here, sort of, I mean, not that secure. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, down here for the receive file and send, send file, send data. So there's not that many things left. So let's go over real fast. That quit function, by the way, is just turning on quit that you saw. I could even have put client handler dot quit equals true. I could have, I probably could have put that too instead, but. All right, so let's get to where we were. We're after received by data. Okay, so we're jumping down here. We're going to finish up with this guy. How am I doing time-wise? Oh, boy. All right. So receive file. So we just bring in the file name, and we're going to make a lock. We're going to make a lock for it right here by saying lock equals self.lock file file name. Okay? Um, that's just going to return a threading lock. And what we'll do is we'll open up the... Uh, the and, and also, it returns a threading lock. But not only that, what it does is it goes up to the server where you saw the file locks and it puts it in there with the file name. So every time a thread, and this is handled inside file lock, wants to access the file, it'll go up to that server level and see is there an active lock for it. If yes, it'll wait until there is no longer an active lock. And then it'll be like, boom, it's an active lock. Okay, he'll put his own lock there and be like, I have this. Okay, it's mine. Okay. Um, that way they don't compete for files. Okay. All right, um, <clears throat> so we just open the file. We, in, we uh, just make a variable called data. Uh, we, give it dot in, we give it a blank string encoded into bytes, which literally gives it nothing, but it sets it up to able to, be, to hold bytes. Because I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna use plus equals and be adding bytes onto it. So if we don't have that already, as if we have it as a string, it'll throw us an error. If we have it as an integer, it'll throw us an error. But if we have it as something that's made to hold bytes, you can see by just doing the blank string dot encode UTF-8, uh, even though there's nothing in it, it still is said that I am a byte variable. And it's okay for us to do plus equals more bytes onto there, okay? And then error equals false. Um, we'll see what that, that's just a flag for if an error happened, we'll send in file. And we'll see what that does. It's basically just down here. If there's no error, just release your lock. Say it was uploaded and then write the data. You know, pretty, pretty straightforward. So, <clears throat> uh, so for this one, uh, we're opening up as write binary because we're receiving it, so we're going to have to write the data to the file. We get the data, and then we write it to our file that we're making. Okay? If the file doesn't exist on the server already, like, write binary automatically makes it if it doesn't exist. It makes it in the form of a text file. So this can only send text files. Actually, that's probably what my next video will be on, doing images as well. Right now, we can only do text files, and then we'll do images as well. So... <clears throat> while true uh, so we're just going to be stuck in here for a little bit we have some break conditions though so don't worry we're not going to get caught in an infinite loop so a chunk equals self.con.receive 1024 see I didn't even use sent, receive by data here I just received <laughs> receive 24 so we're going to receive uh, a data a chunk of the file basically and we're going to check the size of it if it's less than 1024 bytes because they're going to be sending in chunks of 1024 then we know they're at the end of the file, or they hit an error. So we check, because I have them, if they hit an error, they'll send this message right here, dollar sign, dollar sign, error, dollar sign, dollar sign. Because how likely is that to pop up in a text file, right? Um, and especially, not only does it have to pop up in a text file, it has to be that little chunk at the end that's less than 1024. Man, what are the chances? Uh, uh, don't, don't put that in your files. <laughs> but, uh, so if it decodes it, in fact, I could just put equals equals, right? Uh, I probably should put equals equals. Um, so that, that last little chunk exactly has to equal this guy. Um, because maybe it does show up in your file, but it's obviously not an error message. That could throw, that could mess up the server. So I'm going to change that to equals equals. I'm just going to not do it now because it may throw up an error unexpectedly. <laughs> so if that results equals error encounter, check that the file, given file. So if we found error in here, if the other guy had an error, we'll just say error encountered and send it back to them. So we'll close the file. We'll remove the file name because if they uploaded a file that was corrupted, we're just going to delete it. 
right? Why, why have a corrupted file on the server? Then we're going to release it and we're going to say error is true. Uh, the reason I did this instead of a try accept statement, uh, a couple reasons. Um, I could just done a raise and put accept, um, but it was being weird. When I do try accept statement, it's being a little weird. Uh, this way it works as well, because uh, you can use the raise keyword to like throw an error to like trigger an accept statement. By the way, um, but this is a way to do it as well, I guess. Uh, it'd be more elegant, I guess, if you did the raise method. So otherwise, if uh, it's not if it's not less than 10.24, oh, if it is less than 10.24, but there's no error in it, just add that last final chunk to the data and break out. Otherwise, we still have more to go, so we're just going to add the data to the chunk and be done with it. Okay. So, uh, and we already did that, so send data. Uh, pretty straightforward. We have a try step, step statement in here. Um, uh, we just take in the data, we encode it, we get the size of it, and now here's an interesting line. Okay, because I'm going to send them the size. You said, in the old times, I said you could zfill, but I was mistaken on what zfill did. Zfill, I thought when you did zfill 1024, would fill it up to 1024 bytes, but it doesn't. It was putting 1024 zeros out there, which is not what we wanted at all. So what I did was, is I said, okay, well, um, I could do this. Um, where is it? Yeah, so I'm going to make the, the, tr the string, and there's a reason I should do this, because if you send these two guys back to back, they could get strapped on back of each other, and that was the error. That was the big error that I had to find somewhere. If Even though I have two separate send statements, if the other guy doesn't read them fast enough, they'll get stuck together as one message when they end up, because they both come into the buffer, and they're sitting there. Um, so if I make them both 1024 Bits, or at least the first guy, 1024, I know when the guy reads 1024 at a time, he won't mix them, right? They'll be separated. So I'm going to make him 1024 size, but you don't see 1024 here, do you? You see 1032. Well, that's because, right here, to make him bigger, I said, while well, he's not the right size I want, just keep adding zeros to the front of him, right? Because the other guy is going to convert him to an int. It doesn't matter if you have 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 32 or 32. He knows it's 32. So the reason I did 1020, 1032 is because when I encode it, strings have strings inherently have a little bit bigger memory. Uh, they have a full byte more of size than, than just straight up bytes. There's like a whole byte of info that deals with the string. So when I encode it, it loses eight bits of memory. So if I just did 1024, I would get it to a size 1024 string. And then when I encode it, it would become size 1016. So I just need to account for that by just going 1032. Because then when I encode it and it loses that extra byte of memory and that's just like telling data about the string, it'll go down to a size of 1024, which is great. That's what I want. Then I just send the size over um, because the, the other guy's going to read it in 1024 bytes, right? The first thing, he's going to read the size in. And once he knows the size, he'll read the next chunk in at that size, right? So now he's not mixing any. He knows what the size of the next message is when I send a bunch of concurrent ones. So that he knows the exact amount to read every time so that um, uh, they, they don't mix any messages. And the reason I have to send the first one in 1024 uh, is because uh, I won't immediately know the first one's size. So we, they both agree that the first guy's 1024, Okay. Um, so even though it's usually going to be far less, you're not going to need 1,024 digits to express your memory. Uh, no matter what, uh, how many digits I do need, uh, I'll be okay. Um, because I had this while loop that'll pad it up to the right size. So that way I'm always, I'll always be able to get the first message. And once I get him, I'll know the size of every concurrent message that's going to be in a group. And you'll see more on that in a little bit. If there's an error in sending, I'll just print it out with sys.execinfo because I don't really know what this error would be. The other ones, like error encounter, check that the file exists. You know, I assume it's probably they typed in their file name wrong or something. Uh, so, but here I wouldn't know what it was, so uh, I print out the error. And that's for testing purposes. In, in real life, I would just uh, return that error. So send file is pretty similar to uh, receiving file. Uh, so uh, just do another file lock. I'm reading from it. Um, we'll go over file lock a sec. You see it down there. With open file name, uh, write binary file. So we're just going to open it up, get ready to write. Uh, we're just going to read chunks from it. And then we're going to, if it's less than 1024, we're just going to send the chunk. And then we're going to receive 
this part right here, this receive 19. Um, I'm just receiving the message okay. And the reason I did this is because before I would send this chunk and then I would send, because uh, uh, the, the client handler at the end of everything, when it's done with its command, it sends its results over. Let's go back up and see that. Uh, it sends the results, right? And it was sending that last chunk and the results so fast, they were stacking up next to each other. And so some of the results were getting downloaded into files. So I just made it. Where is it? Somewhere. I have them send OK when they're done receiving a file. Should be in receive file. Uh, or was it was it file uploaded to me now? I think it's in the, oh, it's in the client side. Right, right, right. the client, the, it's the client. Because the client's not sending anything back to get stacked up to the server. So I don't need to do it with this receive file where he sends OK back. Uh, it's on the client side where the OK is coming from. But all I'm doing here is I'm just getting the message OK so that there's a, a gap in between the send messages. He'll send his, his last chunk. He'll get an OK, I've gotten the file, you're good to go. And then he'll send him... Uh, you know, the, the end part of sending him the results of the thing, you know, file download in this case. Then he'll release his lock, okay? Um, and then just return. Otherwise, if there's an error thrown, this accept statement hasn't worked yet. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so we'll release the lock because we were like, okay, there was an error, I'm done here. Release it. Because uh, we always got to remember to release it. And then this is where we send the error message. And then we wait for the okay as well. Uh, so both cases, we'll get an OK back because we don't want things stacking up behind each other. We've got to be careful when we're sending a bunch of messages in a row before the guy reads them. And then our results are error encountered. Check that the file exists. And the final bad boy. So uh, no file equals true. So file name, uh, you'll see what this flag does in a sec. So for every, uh, we'll go through all the locks in there. And if x0 is equal to the file name, then we'll say uh, no file was false. So there is a file in there that's already in use. And then we'll try to acquire that lock. If they try to acquire a locked lock, they just wait basically in line. You know, you're tugging on the bathroom stall door, right? And then he'll set his IP. Uh, um, uh, <clears throat> sorry, lost my train of thought. Um, so when he acquires the food, I don't think it should be in there. Why is that there? I actually totally forget why that's in there. The IP part. I don't think that should be in there at all. I think I meant to put that uh, in the delete client thing. Yeah, I don't think it should be in there because uh, there's not supposed to be an IP in there. Uh, it's never thrown in air. Oh yeah, it's not the IP. Huh. Oh, I think that was for testing purposes. Yeah, that was for testing purposes to see who was using what locks. I forgot to take that out. My bad. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So if there wasn't any file in there, we'll just make a new lock or acquire it, and then we'll pump it into the file locks. Okay. So if there's a line, might as well get in it. If there's no line, then boom, let's just do it. And then it returns that lock object so we can release it up here. Okay. And the final guy. Okay. Client. So a lot of his stuff's the same. We just have uh, send file, receive file, you know, and the command thing's the same. So we'll go through this guy pretty quick. Just an IP and a port, opens up a socket and connects. Bing, boom, self.open equals true. This is to know if you've imported him into code and you want to send something down to your client. Well, if he's not open, he'll tell you, oh, hey, by the way, I'm not open. I can't send this, you know. 
I, I added in features so that you can close the client and then when you want, you can reopen and reconnect to the server. It's actually, it's way, it's way, way better than I thought it would, but it was great. Um, so we just have, if it's open, just we have our try accept statement uh, to make sure that if anything goes wrong, we have an out so that the code won't shut down. And the same thing, uh, you just you know upload file, right quit. So every time you tell your client to send a command, it'll go through this. It's not in a while loop like the handler, because the handler's only job is to sit there and wait for stuff. Well, the client can send whatever you want, and you can even change him between people. So it's not good to have him sitting in a while loop in a connection with one guy if you may are going to be changing him between servers and, and just IP addresses in general. So uh, same commands, uh, I don't really think I need to go over these much more, just upload file, download file. If you send nothing, it just returns. So it doesn't even send anything. So the other guy doesn't, you don't get caught in this cycle of waiting for things. Because down here he waits for the results coming back. Instead we're just gonna jump out before that happens because he sent nothing. So the other guy will send back nothing. The guy, he won't even send back anything. And so we'll both be in the listening cycle, which will be bad. Uh, here we check, is it a file? If os.path is a file when we're uploading it, by the way, then we send it. If not, we go file not found, and we send that to the server, uh, or we, we tell that ourselves. Um, we don't even ask them to do it anymore. Because um, file name will pick that up as well. It'll pick that up. Uh, so we don't send anything over if it's file not found, uh, obviously. <laughs> So self.results, well, we just receive what the server did, and that'll be our results as well. But the first time, we're going to receive the size, right? We receive that 1024. We cast as an integer, and then we just read back. Uh, now, earlier, I warned you guys on the stability of not reading in, like, even powers of 2. But that was only for, for files I did it because we got to make sure those are good. But if our results are a little jank, you know, if they come back not 100%, eh, that's not a huge deal. You know, I mean, it's, I don't really... We don't really need them, you know, it's not file that or anything. It's just saying, hey, it was uploaded, and you're like, cool, <laughs> you know. Um, but it should come back fine for a small chunk of data. No big deal. Um, the chances of it messing up are pretty small. Uh, so we return the results we get from the server. This is where we get them right here, and the one above is the size. Okay, if we have any error, we just print it out there. If we're not open, we'll just say, hey, it's not open, bud. Receive files and uh, is pretty much the same, and just instead, we send that okay. That's the, literally the only different line. These are mere images of the other guy. They just send okay. That's the only extra line in them. Uh, just so we get that break in between messages. Okay. And uh, then we have close client, open client. Close client, if it's already, if it's open, it'll close itself and it'll set that variable to false and then just say hey, it's closed. Otherwise, it'll say hey, I'm already closed. It, open client. If it's already open, I'm already open. Otherwise, it'll make a new socket.socket, socket.connect, open itself, and then say it's open. So it'll actually just make a whole new socket object. And then we have the straight up, same as always, uh, the, the arg parser to just take in variables from the command line. Uh, you've seen this in previous videos. It's pretty much the same. We're just taking in command line arguments. This is just for testing. Uh, we make a client. Uh, and then we just have while true loop, and then every time we put in a message, it just calls uh, c.send message. But I also have it, uh, if I say uh, if message is equal to op to open it, and I can also close it. Hmm, I don't have that in here anymore. Oh, I think I would make it break, so it would automatically close, but, huh, which I believe it does. Uh, Oh, this should close. If there's an error sending, it should close. So I'm actually going to put that in. So it's that close. What do I call it? Close that client? Yeah, okay. Do I need to put anything? All right, cool. Close client. All right. So if there's any error, like the other guy isn't listening, he's shut off, he had an error himself, we're just going to close it. So not bad. Um, all right. So that's everything I've been doing. Um, where is that in? Oh yeah, I remember I did in because it was being weird too, but it shouldn't anymore because I fixed the errors that were making it be weird. Do, 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 do. Yeah, all right. So that's the code. Um, it's it's work, been working great. Um, I'm not gonna test it right now because. Uh, 
Uh, my internet's actually getting a little bit wonky today. But um, yeah, so that's all the air handling I did to make sure that I can handle itself no matter what's being thrown at it. Um, I've tried over and over and over, and it's really hard to break the server in the sense that if something goes wrong, you crash the whole server. Uh, even any of them, client handlers to clients, uh, uh, they work well. Like they'll, they'll shut down themselves, but they'll shut down well so they won't have any hanging locks or uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't have a ghost of itself hanging out on the server that, you know, saying this client's still open. They take care of all that. They clean up after themselves if things go wrong. And so that's uh, something uh, that's been really useful for the server to make sure that it's, you know, A-OK, -okay, it's running stable. Um, so if one client has and eh, just freaks out, the whole server doesn't crash like before. So that's uh, all I got going. Um, I hope you guys learned something new. I hope you uh, learned some something on the importance of air handling. And uh, talk to you guys later.